Neural Data Science. I'm your host, Aaron Newman. Today we're going to be working with reaction time data using GitHub Copilot. So what we're going to be working through today is some example reaction time data from a pretend experiment. I made up the data, but that doesn't really matter. And in cognitive psychology, often we do experiments where we ask the participants to make a response by, say, pressing a button as quickly as they can after they see a stimulus. And the reason we do this is that the time that it takes to make a response is related to the amount of cognitive activity or thinking that we have to do in order to make that response. So if we have a simple reaction time study, like we show somebody a flash of light or a, a shape, and we say just press the button as quickly as you can as soon as you see that image, then that simple reaction time, people can do that pretty quickly, maybe as fast as like 250 milliseconds. But we can get more complicated and say like present faces and not faces, faces and houses, say. Let's say press one button if it's a face, another button if it's a house. And then people will be slower because it takes more time to make a decision than it does just to say, oh, something appeared. And in fact, in cognitive psychology, we find that reaction times can be sensitive to things like the relatedness of two stimuli, or uh, working memory load, or other cognitive effects. So it's a very sensitive measure. It's very widely used. And a great starting point before we get into measuring neural data is working with reaction time data. And indeed, it's often very difficult to interpret your neural data if you don't actually know what the human or the other organism was doing when you recorded that neural data. So the behavioral data analysis is often very central to understanding the neural data. This data that we have here was from an assignment that used to be used in this course as a way of testing people's understanding and getting them to practice with like working with lists, slicing lists, combining lists, thinking about data, and that sort of thing. It's trivially easy to do with GitHub Copilot, and so it's no longer an assignment, but it's a nice example of working through and doing a little practice with prompt engineering. So let's get right to it. Here we go. We have some reaction time data. I just generated a set of random numbers between 0 and 1. So we can imagine these are reaction time data measured in seconds. So the first value, 0 0.394, would be 394 milliseconds that it took that individual to respond. We've got these stored in a list called RT. So you see RT equals, that's the assignment operator, and then the square brackets indicate that it's a list and all the elements are separated by commas. So our first question is what type of data is RT in terms of Python data types? And so I've already given you that answer. It's a list, but let's test GitHub Copilot. Its first suggestion for a prompt is totally off base, but it has no context really. So what type of data is RT? Question mark. And it says type RT. And type is the correct function for getting the type uh, variable. And it tells us it's a list. That's awesome. The next question is what type of data is the first value in RT? So we have a list, but remember that lists can contain any number of different types in them and even a mixture of types. So what is the type of the first value, first element of RT? Copilot's pretty good at guessing. And here we go. And here it's saying type RT and then the square bracket zero. So remember the square brackets after a variable name are indexing and the value inside the square brackets is the element in the list that we want to index. Zero being the first element because Python counts from zero. Run that cell and it tells us it's a float. So that's right because all the numbers we saw above were decimal point numbers and those are floats. Next question, how many trials were in this experiment? Okay. Now, this isn't written in sort of Python speak, right, because trials aren't a Python data type, but the trials are the individual reaction times. Each trial is associated with reaction time, so the number of reaction times in the list is the number of trials. Let's see if GitHub Pilot is smart enough to get that. So first of all, it's guessing that I want to ask what's the length of RT. That's actually the right thing to do, so we could just accept that prompt, but let's see what happens if we say how many trials in the experiment. And it's actually smart enough to figure that out as well, which is pretty cool. I'm asking for the length of RT, 24. If you were to scroll back and, and look up there, indeed there are 24 elements in RT. All right, now we're getting into slicing lists. So the first question is print the first nine values in RT. So and it's guessing we want the first five elements in RT, so I'm just going to accept that prompt, edit it to say 9, 
enter. And it gives us RT square bracket, so indexing, 0 colon 9. And that's a perfectly good response. There are a couple of other options, like the 0 there is actually redundant, because if we just said RT colon 9, it would start from the beginning of the list anyway. I'll leave it like that. Either one is fine. But there's our first nine elements, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The other thing we could do is surround that in parentheses and pass it to a print function. And that would give us the same answer, although formatted differently, because print prints things out a horizontal line like that. So that just shows you GitHub Copilot gives you one correct answer, hopefully correct, but there are different ways of doing the same thing often in Python. All right, our next question is to print the last six values in RT. So print the last. So it's guessing we want nine, but we actually want six. And hopefully you remember how to do this. It involves slicing like we saw above, but if we wanted to count back from the end of the list and give it the last x number of values, like six, we have to say minus as our indexer. So here you can see, and this time it's inserting print, maybe because it saw I used print up above. So print RT index, and it goes from minus six to the end of the list, so minus six colon. And indeed that gives us six elements, and they are the last six in the list. Next one is print the values of the 15th through 20th elements of RT. And it was pretty smart to guess that. I think it's because I did a dry run of this lesson before recording it, and I typed that prompt, and it's kind of actually learning the context from this. So that's nice, but before it did generate the correct code anyway, once I typed in the prompt, print RT 14 to 20. So this is one of those questions that for human students learning Python, they might get this wrong because they might index 15 through 20, but the correct answer is 14 through 20. And that's because Python's indexing starts at zero. First element is zero, second element is one, so the 15th element is 14. We still keep 20 because we want to go up to but not including the index 20, which would actually be because the index 19 is the 20th element in the list. And so 15th through 20th, we get the result there. Awesome. All right, here's another one that catches people up when they're human. If we say what is the slowest response time in the data set, and that's GitHub Copilot's suggested prompt, and that's almost right, so let's see what it tells us. And it tells us the correct answer is max RT. Do you think that's right? It is right. It's a little non-intuitive, and that's another one that often caught up students doing this, is because when you say slowest, you think smallest intuitively. In fact, the slowest response means you took the longest amount of time to make a response, so that would be the maximum value in the list RT. And now the complementary question, what is the fastest response time in the data set? I'm actually going to suggest, although it got the answer right before, I strongly suggest that you use variable names in your prompts rather than more abstract things like data set. And in a later lesson, we'll see that at work and how it can be really helpful to get the right and working code. Anyway, here, the fastest response time in RT is, in fact, minimum value in RT. And that gives us the correct answer, so that's great. So another thing that we can do is find the index of a specific value using the dot index method. So um, that question almost gives you the answer, right? Because basically it would be RT dot index and then plug in that value. But let's tell GitHub Copilot to do it because that's our task here today. Okay, so which data point in RT has the value? And yeah, let's just point four nine two two five six three eight question mark rt.index and that value 16. So the 16th element in the RT list has that value. All right, we're going to move on. We started with reaction time data, a bit of a bait and switch here because the lesson's saying we're working with reaction time data, but we're also working with accuracy data. This is pretty common again in behavioral experiments or the behavioral part of a neural experiment is we don't want to know just how fast people responded 
but if they were accurate or not. Because of course we can make really fast responses if we're not paying attention to the stimuli and just mash in the key as fast as we can. Typically we might want to throw out the incorrect responses and only analyze the correct ones, or at least get a sense of like what's the accuracy rate. So what's the proportion of accurate versus inaccurate responses that the person made. So just like above for RT, we've predefined the errors here, the accuracy. And so we've got a list, it's called error, we assign to it, and the values are false and true. And first question is, what Python data type are the values of error? So not the type of error itself, which is a list, but let's ask Copilot, what Python data type are the values of ERR. Oh, I better go and run that cell first, otherwise it won't be defined. Type error. Uh, that's actually wrong, right? That's going to tell us it's a list. So let's see. What Python data type are the values of error? I could try saying individual values of error. And I better delete that code type error index zero. So that's one way of going, doing it. It's not foolproof because the question is what data type are the values, in other words, all the values of error. So if the list contained not just Booleans, but other elements in the list were different types, this would fail at telling us what all the different types are. But in this case, we can see from the list that they're all the same type and that type is a Boolean. So that answer works. But that's one of the things about Copilot is you do want to be thinking about, you know, what is it doing, understand what the code's doing, and make sure that what it's doing is what you actually intended it to do. Next question, how many data points are in here? And that's just the length of the list. And we have 20 data points. And so right here, you might detect there's a problem, and this is something we're gonna work with in this lesson, so it's intentional. There were 24 reaction times, but there's only 20 response accuracy measures. This could happen if there was a bug in the program that was being used to record the data, or maybe it's the case that the way the program worked, if somebody didn't make any response, no, that wouldn't work because they wouldn't have a reaction time either. It's just a, you know, this is just a lesson anyway, so let's roll with it. Question 12. These data are from the same experiment as the RT data, but you'll note we have fewer data points in error. Let's say this is because of some sort of technical error, never mind how, again, we're just playing, but let's say that we do know what the missing data should be. Specifically, the first data point is missing, but we know the participant made an error on that trial. And the last three data points are missing, and we know the participant got all of those trials correct. Again, let's not worry about how we know it, this is just fictional data. So our assignment here is to write five lines of code. It's a little bigger than the previous parts of the assignment. First, we're going to insert a value of the beginning at the beginning of error without changing any of the existing values to reflect the participant's error on the first trial. Then we're going to insert three values using a single line of code at the end of error, indicating correct answers on the last three trials. Then we're going to print out the list error with those changes made. Then we're going to print out the length of error and then we're going to confirm that the length of error is now the same as the length of RT. We're going to confirm that using code, right? We're not just going to use our fingers and count. Then just to be aware of more of an issue if you were writing the code yourself, because hopefully Copilot will nail this for us, but we just redefine error at the top and that's because we're going to be manipulating that list. And if you do it wrong the first time through, then you've broken whatever is in the list error. And so in the future, you'll never get to the right response. So we just redefine error at the top of the cell each time. So whatever the code does, if you change the code later, rerun the cell, you're starting from kind of scratch in terms of the predefined definition of error. Okay, so we have that there. And our first question, or our first task is to search value at the beginning of error that is true. Now, what do true and false mean here? That's actually another thing that we have to think about. This is called error, which means that probably what this is encoding, and I'm telling you what this is encoding, is whether the participant made an error. A little counterintuitive, right? It's not whether they were accurate or not. 
And so if we want to say they made an error on the first trial, then we want the first value to be true. And in fact, Copilot's guessing that correctly. Insert a value at the beginning of error that is true. Enter. Hint. Use the insert method. Hint. Again, these hints are a bit silly because Copilot's <laughs> generating the code. Um, okay, Copilot. This is fun. This is, um, you know, one of the things Copilot does occasionally is it just gets stuck in generating more prompts. And clearly, that's a bit ridiculous. We don't even need hints because we're not writing the code. Copilot's writing the code. But I delete those, and it seems to figure out that that's not what I want. And it suggests error.insert, so the dot .insert method. And the first argument to that is the element where we're inserting it, so the position, 0. And the second argument is the value that we want to insert, which is true. What I suggest is that we don't do this all in one cell, but we do a prompt, get the code, run that, and then check our results before we go on. Because if we make an error somewhere along the way, then we probably shouldn't keep bashing away and generating more code because we'll just complicate our lives. So let's do that. And then the cell below is print error. That's kind of predefined for us just as a way of checking. And indeed, now we see before error, the first element was false. Now the first element is true, so that's great. But let's keep editing this cell and adding more things. So the next prompt is insert a value at the end of error that is false. That's almost right, but I want to say insert three values at the end of error that, let's be grammatically correct, that are false. So error extend, so a different method now, and that method will just extend the list by adding values to the end of it. We don't really need an index. The extend figures out where the end is and just puts stuff at the end. And all three of those values are false. And it's putting them in a list because the extend method only takes a single argument. So it takes the argument of a list and hopefully that will do what we want. So we'll run that. Then we'll run this next cell to print error. Look at the end. And now we see three false values at the end where before the last three values were true, true, false. So that seems to have worked exactly the way we wanted it to. That's awesome. What's our next task? Print out the error with these changes made. Well, that's done here. Print out the length of error. That's our next question. So why don't we do that? Well, let's add it to this cell, just so that all of our answers are in one cell. Print error. It's pretty easy. And the next one is print out the length of error. So print the length of error. Print len error. That's definitely right. And confirm that the length of error is now the same as the length of RT. So confirm that the length is the same as the length of RT. And it suggested RT there, presumably because that's the only other list that is defined in our workspace here. And so what it proposes as our code is saying len error equals equals len RT. So remember, double equals is the actual sort of equals. It's testing whether those two things are equivalent or not. And so the result of that should be either true or false. One thing that we might want to be aware of here is that Python, or sorry, Jupyter, only prints the last output of a cell by default. In this case, that should work, as we're explicitly calling print commands for getting the values in error and the length of error. But if we wanted to be safe, we might want to embed that in a print statement. And we get three outputs here. So the first is error itself. The second is the length of it, which is now 24. And the last line is true, meaning that test of whether the length of error and the length of RT are the same, true, so they are the same. There we go. So Copilot's uh, doing pretty well with a, a little help from our, ourselves. And that does depend on our knowing a bit of Python, even if we can't remember all of the nitty gritty details of the syntax every time. Okay, how many errors did the participant make? Use code specifically a list method to generate the answer. And this wasn't covered in a previous lesson, so that's a case where 
without AI, you would have to use a help command or the, the internet to help you out. But hopefully GitHub Copilot makes that unnecessary. So how many errors did the participant make? That's a pretty high level prompt because we're not referencing names of variables themselves. So GitHub Copilot would have to make some inferences there that the number of errors relates to the error list and also that the participant made that this is from an experiment where there are participants and that's what's reflected in that list. And the answer it suggests is some error, seven. And if we count, so maybe that's a little counterintuitive unless you remember how Booleans work from a previous lesson. But the way Booleans work, now we see true, false, or false, true, etc. True has a value of one and false has a value of zero. And Python sees Booleans in that regard. And so if you say the sum, that'll basically be the sum of all the values in the list where that's the number of trues, right? So if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, I didn't start at the beginning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The rest are false, so there are seven trues. And remember I said the error defines is true means that you made an error. So that is absolutely correct. And pretty impressive on the part of Copilot to make the inferences from our prompt to the actual value. It doesn't always work, but it's nice when it does. So it's not uncommon in behavioral studies or other research to have outliers, one or a few values that are exceptionally different from the majority of values. These can be problematic for statistical analysis. That's because typically if you have a lot of values that are clustered and kind of similar to each other, they have a mean, they have a, a variance, a standard deviation, but if you have one value that's say, you know, two or three times bigger or smaller than the other values, that has what we would call undue leverage on the statistics. And that's because the deviation on that one point increases the measures of variance significantly. And that one point, for example, if you're fitting a regression line, that one point could have a disproportionate effect on the slope of the regression line. So really it, it's often good from a statistical standpoint to remove outliers. And it's also good from a conceptual standpoint. So this is reaction time data. If somebody's reaction time is exceptionally long compared to all or most of their other reaction times, that may be that they like sneezed or scratched their nose or just you know got distracted before they made the response. And of course, if we're trying to infer cognitive processing from speeded responses, those delayed responses don't really reflect just the cognitive processing, they reflect that plus the sneezing or whatever else was going on. So long story short, we wanna find outliers and remove them from the data. And above when we found the longest RT in the data, I didn't really dwell on the value, but it was well over one, I think it was about 1.5, which is much longer than most of the other values in the data set, which are all in the sort of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 kind of range. So let's try and remove that from the data. And when we do this, we should also remove the corresponding trials data from the error list because we want the errors to align with the reaction times. Question 14 asks us to write code that does the following. Find the position, i.e. the index of the slowest RT in the data, remove the slowest RT value from RT, remove the data from error that corresponds to the trial you just removed from RT. So in other words, the value in error that has the same index as that index that we got in the first bullet point there. Print the slowest RT remaining, rounded to two decimal places, that is after removing the outlier, and print the lengths of RT and error using a single print command with accompanying text to make it clear which value is the length of RT and which value is the length of error. This can be accomplished in five lines of code. Copilot will probably do that for us. For humans, sometimes the way you approach the problem, you might actually do it in more lines of code, get it working, and then worry about paring it down and figure out which lines you could make more efficient by combining them into one. I'm, I'm gonna guess that, that Copilot will be okay doing it in five lines of code. Okay, so in this box, we're defining RT and error again. The reason we're doing that is if there's any errors with the code, again, we want to redefine them at the start so we're not trying to fix errors on versions of these lists that are already kind of mangled by whatever code we wrote that didn't work correctly. So start with the first prompt. Find the index of the slowest value in RT. And 
RT index, max RT. Okay. Find the index of the fastest value. That is not what we want to do. But I'm going to pause here and point out one thing. Copilot's doing what we asked it to do. But remember that Jupyter only outputs the last command it was run in a cell that generated output unless you explicitly use print commands. So the point of doing this isn't just to find it for Python to do the thing, but for us to see that. So let's embed that in a print command so that we actually get output when we run it. Next is remove the slowest RT value from RT. Remove the slowest value from RT. So rt.pop13. I don't really like that. That's really not good coding style because 13 might actually be, if we count 10, 11, yeah. Yeah, it might be the right value, but that depends on us knowing already the index of the max value, which we did get up here, but that's not really great. Okay, so I do option square bracket, and now I get another suggestion, which is rt.remove max rt. So that's much more robust code in that it'll always find the maximum value in RT, even if that's not the 13th element in the list. Again, using your brain, understanding what Copilot is generating, what the Python code does, and critically evaluating, is that really what I want to do, is an important part of coding with Copilot. And it next suggests remove the corresponding value from error. So in fact, that is what we wanted to do, but again, not with that. So option square bracket, we get error pop RT index max RT. So that seems about right. And since these are just removing things from the list, we're not asking it to print because there's no output to print. So next we want to print the slowest RT rounded to two decimal places. So print the slowest RT rounded to two decimal places. And it gives us print round max RT comma two. So it's using the round function. The input to that is max RT and the number of decimal places is two. And then finally, we want to print the lengths of RT in error now that we've removed elements using a single print command with text that makes it clear which is RT and which is the length of error. So it starts out with the right prompt, print the length of RT and error with text describing what the numbers mean. It's a little vague, but maybe it'll work. Let's see what it does. Print, the length of RT is, in quotes, so that's a string, and then plus string length RT, so that's right. And that's another gotcha that students learning Python often miss, is you might be inclined to just put len RT in there, but the print command only takes strings as input, not integers or floats. And so we have to convert that numerical value to a string here and it's chaining together different parts of the print statement with pluses, which will just put them together without spaces in between. So the length of RT is, and then the length of RT, length of error is, and then again, string length error, and even a period at the end. So that looks dandy. Shift enter to run that, and here's what we get. So the first output is 13. That's the index of the max RT value. Remember before it was trying to like pop 13. So it, it did know it got the right index, just wasn't very robust code. So that's right. Remove the slowest value from RT. Those didn't generate outputs. And then print round max RT 2. So that's our maximum RT after removing the outlier. If you look through here, indeed, that value is in the list. There it is. And it's not 1.5. That was the biggest value before, but that's otherwise the biggest value. So that's correct. And then it tells us the length of RT is 23, the length of error is 23. So great, it seems like it worked, but it didn't. There is a fatal flaw in this code. I encourage you to pause if you haven't detected it already. Pause, reread the code, think about what it's doing in sequence, and then unpause and we'll get the big reveal. So I left my cursor at the line where the error occurred as a hint. Don't know if you caught that or not. The issue is, that we have to evaluate these lines of code in sequence. So we print the index of the max RT, then we remove it, then we remove the value in error that corresponds to the index of the max RT. The problem is that we already removed our outlier. So at this point, it's going to remove the error corresponding to the new maximum RT, which is 0.84, which is a valid trial. We don't want to do that. It's removing the wrong index. So 
The problem is that the index, th this is the right way to find the location in the RRT list, the index of the maximum RT. We want to do that before we remove the outlier, otherwise we're going to get the wrong answer. So there's a couple of ways to fix that. One of them is just to take this line out from there and move it up above our RT remove command. Um, totally valid and we shouldn't really expect to use AI for every little bit of coding. We should, you know, when we can see a fix and do it, then we should do it. Another way to approach this, and maybe what I'll do is remove these, let's see, remove the, these three. I'll take it that way. Okay, so before the prompt was to find the position of the slowest RT in the data. So find the position of not the first error, slowest RT in RT, and assign it to a variable. Slowest RT equals RT index max. So now, now that I've stored that in a variable, it doesn't really matter if I remove that value from the RT list because we still have that index stored in its own variable. And so the next thing we want to do is remove the slowest value from RT. RT pop slowest RT. And see now, instead of plugging in max RT there, it sees, oh, we defined that variable. We might as well use it. And then remove the corresponding value from error. I don't super like that prompt because it's not very specific. Corresponding in what way? That's not really clear. So let's say remove the value from error that corresponds to the slowest RT. I like that. And we didn't use slowest underscore RT, but the phrase in there is very aligned with the name of our variable, so that's pretty foolproof. And indeed, error.pop, and it plugs in slowest RT. So that's great. Now at this point, since we already had this code working, we could leave it and run it. But I do want to take this opportunity to, well, let's take out this line of code and print the slowest RT because now since we've defined slowest RT what's it going to do? Oh no, it's smart. It didn't in this case guess that we meant the variable slowest RT but instead it's printing rounded value of max RT rounded to two decimal places so that's the same thing we had before so that's great. Again working with Copilot always a bit of an adventure and we just have to be careful and attentive to what it's doing. So the Max RT now is 0.84, length of RT is 23, length of error is 23, so we are golden. I can remove that extra cell there. Those were just kind of buffers in the textbook. This tells you we just went through. And okay, we can jump to question 15. Last one is print out all the values of RT sorted from compile it's just smallest to largest. I want to say fastest to slowest. It's actually the same. Print sorted RT. So I said don't modify the original order of RT values in doing this. That was more something that students are likely to do, but not something copilot's likely to do, given that prompt. And indeed, sorted is the function to sort the values of a list. When we run sorted on a list, it just outputs the sorted values. It doesn't actually resort the list, so it's doing what we asked it to do. We can confirm that if I just say print RT that the sorted values start with 0.333, but if I just print RT, it still starts at 0.394. So again, sorted didn't modify the values in RT, it just sorted them prior to output. All right, so that brings us to the end of the lesson. You should now have a good sense of how to work with lists in Python, including how to access specific values, add values, remove values, and how to find the length of a list. You should be beginning to understand how to use Python to answer questions about your data, such as how many trials there were, how many errors were made. You should also have some understanding of how to use Python to clean your data, and that's what we're doing here. So we're taking those basic Python functions and seeing them in the context of cleaning up reaction time data, as opposed to a more abstract, just like remove an element from a list for no particular reason whatsoever. You should also have a sense of how to use Python to check your work, such as by printing out values, or in one case, we paired the lengths of two lists to make sure they were the same. Developing your ability to read code, including the code that's generated by Copilot, understand what it does and how it does it, 
and developing your ability to critically evaluate code, identify errors in it, including copilot generated errors, and how to fix those errors. All right, that's the end of our lesson. Thanks for watching, and tune in next time for another lesson on AI assisted coding with GitHub Copilot. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe.